resulting from them. Um, there were two good things about British Council publications. One is that they're good. Two, the second is that they're free. Um, and that means that, that we do have some copies, hard copies here on the table over there. Um, but also they're free online. So please um, read them. Please feel free to use any of our publications. We have about 150 publications around the issue of language. Um, and feel free to use them as you wish with your students. And please tell us that you're using them because that will allow me to convince my bosses to invest in more research and more publications if they're being used. Um, we're going to start off with this book and research project called English Across the Fracture Lines, English Peace, Security, Stability, and I'm going to hand over to Beth Erling and Mike Solly. No, we are speaking English and our, French, our slides are in French. It would be a disaster if we did it the other way around on my part. <laughs> um, so, good morning, well, bonjour, salam alaikum. In this presentation, we will be telling you about a British, a British Council publication being launched here today. As John said, English across the fracture lines. It looks at a range of contexts where English is used to build bridges across fracture lines and where people are integrating peace building and intercultural communication into English language teaching initiatives. Okay, so English, of course, as well as being a potential bridge across fracture lines, has all too often contributed to their creation. And the book readily recognizes the problematic history of the field of English language teaching. The aim of this book is to provide a critical space for the voices of people involved in educational and research incentives around the world who have noted opportunities for using English language education as a means of promoting intercultural understanding and empathy. Uh, this trend, I think it should also be noted, is primarily occurring between non-native speakers of English. English is a part of people's multilingual repertoires. It serves as one language, of course, amongst many. Um, and also the connection with the, uh, the SDGs, um, because there are a, a, a lot of chapters, there are a lot of SDGs that are referenced, as well as quality education, um, climate action, peace, justice and strong institutions, etc. So, why, this to why is this topic of interest to the British Council? Well, the British Council has a long history of working in countries that have had periods of intense upheaval and conflict and tried to respond to the needs of people undergoing transitions not of their own making. Often, this is in the field of education and particularly in the field of English language teaching, learning and training. A long history is here in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in the Middle East, in Syria, and in all of Syria's neighboring countries. So the current crisis in Syria and the huge influx of refugees to neighboring countries, which have taken in many times the number of refugees from the crisis than the rest of Europe put together, has made us all examine how we can help both the refugee communities and the countries that host them. In the case of refugees, this is through attempting to diminish their sense of vulnerability and to increase the protective factors that can build their resilience. Because of the British Council's long-standing presence in Syria and its neighboring countries of Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq and Turkey, we felt that there was a crucial need to respond to the social and educational challenges of both the refugee communities themselves and, of course, those that host them. Um, with this in mind, the British Council commissioned a report that was published last year and, as John mentioned, is available freely on our website, which has generated a huge amount of interest 
and is expanded beyond just uh, uh, the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Af uh, Sub Africa, but across the world. This research and publication led us to thinking about exploring how English and other languages could act as a positive force in a variety of difficult or challenging contexts. And so we commissioned Professor Beth Erling to edit um, a book that would look at a wide range of different contexts in Africa, Asia and the Middle East, as well as in the UK and Australia. And it's um, here at this conference that we have um, the, this book in our hands for the first time after having worked on it for over a, a year with all of the contributors. I just take this from the blurb of the book. So in the book, we take stock of initiatives undertaken around the globe in which English is being used and taught in situations of conflict, emergency, and reconciliation to promote stability and peace. As Mike said, it, pro it provides the space for reflection on how, how English language teaching can nurture learners' well-being by, uh, by equipping them with a language in which not only injustice and pain are articulated and expressed to the wider international community, but also forgiveness and empathy. Um, these are the contexts that have wound up being represented in the world, uh, in the book. Obviously, there are a number of contexts and, um, that could be represented, but in the end, these are the ones that we uh, have wound up being in, um, included. There are um, two main themes in the book, and the chapters are divided in these two main sections. Um, the first one is really about the English language classroom, um, the, the site of the classroom, um, and ways in which people are promoting resilience, empathy, and resistance in their teaching. And in the second, uh, theme, it's more sort of the general context of English and its role in the world in creating and maintaining relationships and stability locally and globally. Um, again, the publication is available over there. I hope you'll pick up a copy after this talk, but this gives you an idea of some of the chapters in these two sections, and I'm really pleased that several of our authors are here at the conference. Um, Lucy Costa um, um, and um, yesterday we had um, Joseph Kaleba Wallengini uh, pr um, presenting about uh, his project of English clubs in the DRC. Um, and we have Peter Hare here as well. I hope I haven't met him yet. Um, yes. So, um, Mike is going to tell you a little bit about two of the chapters that uh, he particularly enjoyed. Yeah, I'm best going to talk in more detail about some of the chapters, but I just wanted to briefly talk about two that really struck me personally, both of which happen to be about sharks, which um, is one of my great fears ever since I saw a film in 1975 as a child that my parents had actually forbidden me from seeing um, that stopped me going into the water for a long time until I discovered much later on that actually we only have basking sharks which don't eat people in the waters of the UK. So Rosalind um, Appleby explores the complex links between environmental degradation and migration and how English language education may promote environmental awareness and intercultural understanding. She argues that environmental crises are a crucial area to be explored by English language education and provides many ideas, practical ideas, of how ELT can incorporate not just the shallow environmental, environmentalism often, in present, often present in English language course books, but critically address the underlying causes such as consumerism and the addiction to economic growth. In her classes with un undergraduate students, largely Chinese students, doing English for academic purpose courses in Sydney, um, 
She uses her own complicated feelings about sharks as an interested environmentalist, but also as a keen open water swimmer. Um, she uses texts from different perspectives, both from the, uh, uh, newspapers with a kind of sensationalized hatred of sharks to more um, uh, objective scientific reports around sharks and also discussion blogs uh, looking at the rights and wrongs of culling or um, conservation um, and got her students to look at all these different environmental perspectives and then crucially ask them to think about their own areas uh, from different lenses. The second, uh, uh, the second one that interested me in particular was Daniel uh, Zeri. Um, he is from Malta. Uh, thank you, Beth. Um, from Malta, um, an island, of course, that is between Europe and, and Africa, and therefore a convenient place for refugees seeking a new life in Europe. Daniel explains how he started to notice an air of intolerance among students towards the growing number of refugees in their community. In an urgent attempt to promote empathy and cohesion, he describes how he turned to multicultural poetry in the English language classroom to pro provide students with vicarious experiences that enable them to develop an appreciation of diversity. Arguing that poetry is well suited to promoting empathy and transporting people into other people's minds, he provides the inspiration for the types of multi multilingual poems that can be used in the English language classroom and the ways in which teachers might maximize them to use the, in the, class, to use the classroom as a space where attitudes and beliefs in relation to migration can be questioned. And I'd like to just uh, finish with a particular poem that he, he uses in the classroom, which some of you may know by the uh, uh, Kenyan British poet born in Kenya to Somali parents uh, called Conversations About Home at the Departures Centre. And this is where the shark comes in. You have to understand that no one puts their children on a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. The final chapter I'll talk to you about today, um, and as I said, you can read them, read all of them in, in the book, is one um, by Barbara Birch and Ilham Nasser. And some of you might be familiar with the work of Barbara Birch. She's a professor of linguistics at the at, um, Cal State Fresno. And she wrote a book, um, a seminal book in 2009 about the English language teacher and global civil society. So she's been promoting this idea about the English language as um, the English language teachers as um, um, promoters of peace and empathy for a long time. And in this chapter, she tells the story of how she came across the work of Ilham Nasser, who is also working in the Middle East, and how the two of them together designed a research program in which they involved over 400 teachers, and how they together gathered stories of, of, um, of um, dealing with conflict in the classroom. And in this chapter, they kind of pull together their ideas for how English language education can promote forgiveness in divided societies. And um, <clears throat> she, they also argue that teachers are particularly well placed to model forgiveness and offer al alternatives to destructive cycles of conflict and violence. Um, and in this chapter, they present ideas for identifying the type of skills that students need in order to make the choice to forgive. And they show how teachers and curriculum planners can collect or elicit, elicit these forgiveness stories and create a for forgiveness curriculum in any subject, really. But they argue that the English language classroom is a particularly um, good place to do that. Um, and um, they, they talk about how the English language classroom can be used as a site for promoting dialogue and forgiveness and contribute to sustainable peace building and a socially just world. Um, and here they, in the chapter you can read about the modules that they developed and that they focus on these various topics 
that came out of their research and the views um, um, that, that can promote conflict resolution. Um, and these are the, the name of some of the modules um, in English. They're identifying and managing emotions, apologizing and accepting apologies, forgiving and reconciling, analyzing a conflict before choosing a response, taking responsibility for your own actions, understanding others' motivations and interests, and finding ways to revol resolve conflicts. I'll finish by arguing, as they do in this chapter, that teachers in general, and English language teachers in particular, are and can be at the heart of peace building. Um, as they say, when we teachers limit our pedagogical goals to correct pronunciation, grammar, and vocabulary, when we restrict our attention to sanitized speech functions, facile interactions and simplistic intercultural communication, we fail to imagine realistic alternatives to the status quo. We waste our strategic positions and power to educate for a peaceful and more sustainable world. Um, and they draw on the argument by James Paul Gee, who, Gee, who says, like it or not, English language teachers stand at the very heart of the most crucial educational, cultural, and political issues of our time. Finally here, these are, this is a summary of the, the types, the examples uh, put forward in the chapters of how the English language classroom, English language teaching classroom can play an important role in building a safe and sustainable environment for present and future generations, help to develop students' attitudes and beliefs in relation to migration, integration, the environment, and peace, open up possibilities to create counter discourses that oppose dominant narratives, and be used to create a space in which new ideas, concepts, and ideologies can be voiced, allowing forgiveness and transition to be discussed and imagined. Um, and and the, um, finally, to provide a transformative space, pro promoting forgiveness and peace. And, you know, we know that these are um, some, some yeah, goals uh, that we are putting a lot of responsibility on English language teaching here. Um, but we wanted to provide a space for hope and potential in this book um, and the ideas from so many projects functioning around the world that have these aims as, as their core. Um, so yes, thank you, merci, and um, please pick up your copy and if you don't want to have a heavy luggage coming back, then you can always get the PDF copy online as well. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Any um, questions or comments? Got one here, any others? Anybody else want to queue up for the next question? Okay, well, st Tony Capstick had the, his hand up first, and then we'll move to this gentleman. Um, thank, thank you to both speakers. Fascinating work, and great to see the publications um, being launched at an, an event like this. Um, my question to both of you, which is a big question, about those kind of curriculum that you just the forgiveness curriculum and the kinds of points that Beth ended with. Um, could you say a little bit more about where you see this fitting in teacher education programs? Um, you have a wealth of experience working on teacher education. Where might this fit in? Or do you, do you, can you give us examples of where it already fits in, in the training, um, initial training, or continuing professional development for teachers? Fitting into teacher education programs in general. OK, let's take a comment or question from over this side. Uh, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's very interesting and then it's really good in many areas. As a teacher of English also, I would like just to ask you, have you thought about the freedom of teachers to choose what they want to teach? Because most of the time they are given a curriculum 
and they don't have much freedom. Thank you very much. Yeah, very in, a very interesting question that isn't about, about at what level decisions are taken about what to teach, how to teach, what what values to reflect. Good point. Pamela, who'd like to uh, comment on that? I certainly don't have all the answers. I, I have a couple of ideas. Maybe Mike can add some. But um, about. Um, I mean, in, in a way, your questions are related to the um, integrating a f forgiveness curriculum into a standardized curriculum, or, and also integrating it into teacher education. Um, I think that some teacher education programs are already including things for citizenship, um, creative, critical education, or um, cosmopolitan education and that kind of thing and I think that the sort of things that teachers were are talking about doing in these chapters can um, um, what's the word kind of build be put in places like like that um, as you mentioned teachers don't always have a lot of freedom um, but Particularly in the chapter I was talking about by Birch and Nasser, who probably have more, uh, more and better answers to your questions than than I do. They are the authors of these chapters. Um, they, um, I think, the, the the need for feeling that there needed to be a forgiveness curriculum came from these teachers' experiences, and that they were already dealing, having to deal with these kind of issues in their classroom every day so that the, the, it wasn't the sense of something being imposed on the teacher but the sense of teachers saying how, how can we do this how can we even teach within these classrooms where there's these attitudes and beliefs and 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 tensions so um, and I think that they can just kind of extend and be added on to a lot of the things that we are already doing in in communicative language teaching, but Mike, I don't know. Do you have anything? Well, yeah, huge questions. Um, I, I think on the issue of teacher freedom, um, I mean that's something. Um, I, 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 never, I don't know where we're going to find the answers to that, but I do see um, in my own experience um, and experience of many colleagues who have worked in areas of conflict, um, one of the things that I, I don't think as best as you can't get away from, from conflict, the, the conflict area being in the classroom when uh, the issues are so raw. Uh, so I think it's just there, whatever happens. In terms of having that, um, uh, if you like, um, institutional buy-in, um, I think their evidence needs to be seen um, and gathered that um, that introducing notions such as forgiveness and empathy and so on into the classroom has positive results. So as so often, I think it's about gathering the data. OK, thank you very much. We're going to move on to the uh, our second publication, uh, which we're very proud of. That's this publication. Multilingual Classrooms, Opportunities and Challenges for English Medium Instruction in Low and Middle Income Contexts. This is a research project generated by the British Council and the Edu EDT, the Education Development Trust, uh, which we funded together and then, uh, and then agreed with the Open University to uh, carry out the, re the literature search and the, the, re the field research. The field research uh, consisted of work in two places, Ghana and India, Bihar in India. Uh, we're going to start off by looking at what Ghana, the use of local languages and English in Ghanaian primary schools, tensions between language in education, policy and pedagogy. I'm going to ask Beth to come back. So, quick switch of slides and gears. <coughs> this 
so as John said, um, I'm going to be talking about the Ghanaian part of a study that we did, which was funded by the British Council the Education Development Trust and the Open University. And in talking about this, I have to um, mention all of the people who were involved in, in this project. Lena Adenolfi, who is going to talk to you in a minute, uh, in 20 minutes, about the India part of it, our colleague Christina Holkgren, and also the people who helped us collect the data, um, Makafri Tugli in uh, Ghana and Snehal Shah in India. So, why this project? I think all of our institutions, um, I was recently at the Open University until August of this year, uh, and I was at that university for the duration of this project. Um, and the Open University is active in international teacher education. And all of our institutions um, recognize the need to provide education through an, an accessible medium uh, to to students that's accessible, a medium that's accessible to students and teachers. But we also recognize and feel in our everyday practice the, the importance giving, given to English by students, teachers, politicians. So we were looking for evidence of effectiveness of current policies and practices, um, perceptions of these policies and practices, and ways in which we could make um, ways in which we might be able to make the multilingual, um, make multilingual education in these English medium dominant contexts work better. We chose two contexts for this research, um, and they're really very different types of contexts, but they, um, but they are sort of rather typical of um, EMI contexts. In, in the world today. Um, the first is Ghana, where um, in government schools, um, lang the official language policy is that um, from grade one to three, the mother tongue of the local area is used in schooling, and school uh, children transition to English medium instruction from grade four of school and for the remainder of their education. Um, there are something between 79 and 81 officially recognized languages in, Ga in Ghana, and there are 11 languages that are recognized by the government for use in primary education. Um, so the, the policy, the current language policy, so this is the current language policy in, in Ghana, that teaching and learning should be in the local languages from grade one to three. English is taught as a subject during this time. The ratio of local language to English should decrease in grades one to three, with English incre incrementally increasing. English should be used as a medium of instruction at upper primary levels, so from grade four. Um, it is then still also taught as a subject, and a Ghanaian language is also taught as a subject. So we were in Ghana. We were looking at the effectiveness of this pro uh, this policy and and how it is implemented in practice. Um, we um, the first thing we did was to conduct a fairly rigorous review of existing literature in the area and uh, about Ghana. There's there's quite a lot, um, and which included over 77 studies, and um, and we have published about this literature review elsewhere here at the bottom in, in uh, the 2000 and in, in 2016 in comparative education. If you're interested in the details of that. The main, over, the main findings of this review was that the previous research had already identified many practical barriers to implementing this language and education policy as I've defined it. Um, and these were that students don't necessarily speak one of the 11 go government languages, that teachers don't necessarily speak the local language of the school, that particularly in urban areas, there's diverse multilingual classrooms, 
that students may not have a mother tongue, and, and everyone has been talking about that here, how you know you might have the language of your home, the language of the community, then you move community and then you pick up that language and then there's the different language of the school, which might be the, lang the, the kind of indigenous language of the area, but because of migration, the people there actually speak another language. Um, and, and that there is a lack of resources. So even though you have this mother tongue policy, even in lower primary schools, there are um, and where teachers are supposed to be teaching mathematics, science, whatever, through the mother tongue, there are no books available or very few resources available in these languages. The research also identified another of a number of attitudes working against the implementation of the policy that promoted the mother tongue. So, um, previous research had identified that local languages are associated with powerlessness, and that it, local language education might be per, uh, perceived as a means of perpetuating marginalization, whereas English is viewed as a language of education and economic development. And that English, and this is a main thing, that English is used as a main gate, gatekeeper to higher education. It's the language of assessment, the, langu the language you need for public sector jobs and that kind of thing. There are strong beliefs that maximum ex exposure and the earlier the better is, is, is most effective in terms of English learning. But we also saw that attitudes were changing and that more and more people were um, aware of the positive benefits of using the mother tongue both to develop English language te learning and subject learning. So we wanted to see what the state of play was like um, now. Um, we undertook some field work in four schools, um, all in the greater Accra region, one in a more urban area uh, that was very diverse and multilingual, and one in a more rural area that was um, more monolingual. And this just gives you an idea of what the schools were like. We observed um, 15 uh, officially observed 15 lessons and we were really trying to see what kind of multilingual practice was going on. We had interviews with 25 participants, the teachers who we observed teaching, head teachers, education officials. And um, so to the findings, um, with regard to teaching and pedagogy, we found that do teacher-dominated, textbook-focus, English-only pedagogy was dominant. We found an almost a complete absence of co code switching and um, local language use. Here I should say we looked at upper primary classrooms where the transition should already have happened, but we, we knew from experience and from previous data that the language, the level of the English was, was quite low. Um, there is a focus on memorization of content knowledge. If students were involved in lessons by being asked questions, they were mainly closed questions, seeking a correct answer or a one-word response. We observed no pair work, no group work, no discussion, no dialogue. And interestingly, we observed no structured speaking activities in English, not even in the English lessons. And, we, and there was no alignment of the English language curriculum and the curriculum in which learning was happening in English. With regards to the students, there's not a lot we can say because we didn't observe them doing much. They spoke very little in the lessons. When, it was, when student talk occurred, it was almost always limited to choral response or reading out loud. They almost always responded in English, um, but this was usually a short word or phrase. And they used local languages only rarely, and sometimes amongst themselves whispering when passing out books or something like that, but not with the teacher. Um, so, um, attitudes. We found that there is, there is uh, among teachers and the education stakeholders an awareness of the importance of using st students' home languages, but there are still strong perceptions of a, the language and policy, language policy being English only, and that code switching or translanguaging or use of different languages is an illicit practice 
Um, and there's still association with English as being an elite language. And here are just some examples of this. And the bottom quote at the bottom says, if you don't speak English, you keep quiet. You can't speak it. If you can't speak it, keep quiet. I tell them, you shut up. Because teacher doesn't understand the twee, so it's English. I'm doing this to encourage them. So it's this kind of attitude that's kind of silencing students, and if they can't speak English, they don't speak at all, and then they wind up not speaking at all. There are also still associations with English as an elite language. Um, this quote says, even though the school's policy is there, English language seems to have the upper hand. Most parents, you know, are deceived to send their children to the private schools because there, the moment the children, you know, you, you take them through the English language, the moment they come home and they're able to rattle on in the English language, then they think, oh. So what parents are looking for is just, their students to be able to rattle on in English. They don't care about quality of learning. Um, there's also um, negative attitudes to the use of Ghanaian languages in school and classrooms. And this was an anecdote they told. I think there was a parent teachers meeting uh, where they introduced the teachers of the school and they introduced the English teacher and everybody claps and they introduced the math teacher and everybody claps and they, go they introduced the Ghanaian language teachers and nobody claps. Um, and there were other uh, stories about parents coming to schools and hearing teachers speaking Ghanaian language and then complaining to the school and directors and things. So based on our findings, we put forward a number of recommendations in the book, both at the policy and the practical level. Policy level recommendations are really, we need flexible uh, policies. We need to move from the idea of, of schools and um, and. and and NGOs and education um, organizations asking questions like what's the best medium for education to how can we use how can we how can multilingualism be used as a resource for learning and if policies are flexible and multilingual even if there's an official language of school all of students um, linguistic resources can be valued. Uh, we need policies that legitimate and promote the strategic use of classroom cl code switching and translanguaging. Um, and we need to promote the continued use of local languages beyond pr primary school. We need also to promote the idea that English is an important resource, but only one resource among many. And also that the English that we're using and teaching is a localized form of the language. In order to do these things, we have to change attitudes. And I think if we can't shift these attitudes, we have to need to find ways to shift attitudes. So we need to take in policy and, and practice and in, our um, and in our institutions a clear stance against English only. We maybe need to change our te um, te uh, terminology and not talk about EMI, but an English focus. We need to make clear that code switching and translanguaging don't go against policies. And we need to foster a change of attitudes towards these practices. Maybe we can do this through media campaigns, radio. Um, maybe we could do this by reducing the role of English as a gatekeeper to public sector jobs, because I think real things need to happen for people to change their attitudes to local languages that English not be the only language of assessment, that English is not the main only language of higher education or of the public sector, that um, we need to think about ways of community engagement with research about EMI and the relationship between language use and school and learning. And I know Barbara Trudell has been thinking about interesting ways to do this. And we, we need to disseminate this information, this, the, the kind of research that we're um, collecting here in a conference like this, where we recognize that these things are, that there's no question about using the mother tongue in school, but why aren't those messages getting out there? Okay, so that is the Ghanaian context, and I believe we could have one or two quick to the point clarifica clarification questions about my presentation before we move on to Lena, but we've reserved a space at the end for a discussion about the wider issues. So if there are any clarification questions, I could take them.
but if there aren't, we'll just move swiftly on. Well, in that case, thank you very much indeed, Beth. And we'll move on to Lena Adinolfi of the Open University, who's going to talk on a comparison of language policies and practices among low-cost English medium and government schools in Bihar, India. Lena. So, um, although this is a very different con context to um, Ghana, which Beth um, spoke about, they're both colonial countries, former colonial countries, and there are a number of um, similarities between them. So India, um, some of you may be aware, is a vast country with over a million, um, over a billion inhabitants. Um, it's divided into 36 states or union territories, each of which is fairly autonomous. It's highly diverse in terms of um, its socio, um, social and ethnic constitution. It also has um, a, a very large number of languages, although um, 448 have been identified by ethnologue. That, um, in the last census, 6,000 were um, were cited um, by the people. Um, so, of course, it's very difficult to to distinguish between one and another. Uh, and there are 25 writing scripts representing the, the, these languages. Hindi is the official language um, with English as an associate language, but there are tensions around both languages being used, especially between the North and the South. Um, and um, again, like Ghana, which has 11 official languages, um, India has 22 state languages, so each, each state is associated with one to three official state languages, but there are also over 100 other recognized languages for use. So this makes it very complicated. Um, the India's language policy um, it, it, it appears very positive. It's, it's, it's language and education policy appears very positive on paper in that um, it, it, it focuses on the mother tongue as a medium of instruction. Um, it, um, uh, the, I should mention this policy has been um, in place for many, many years, and this is the state or government school policy. Um, the mother tongue or local language or state language um, as the main language of instruction. Um, a second language introduces a curricula um, subject um, is Hindi in the non-speaking, non-Hindi speaking states or another modern Indian language in the Hindi speaking states. And a third subject uh, language would be English and that the advice was to introduce that at primary five. Um, as in Ghana, um, there are, these things don't always work as intended. Um, the state or local or language doesn't always correspond to children's mother tongue or first language. Um, there um, is little motivation in the non-Hindi speaking states to learn another modern Hindi language. Um, schools are under increasing pressure to introduce languages at primary one rather than, sorry, to introduce English at primary one. And um, again, there's a lack of uh, skilled English language teachers. Another problem, again, uh, similar to Ghana, is that university tuition remains in English. So there is a mismatch between um, somehow ch children or young adults have to gain competence in English um, before entering university. Um, until recently, um, India had two um, educational sectors, the elite private sector, which um, is um, a, a legacy from the colonial period, um, and the, it is English medium, usually quite expensive, often a religious school, um, and, and um, yeah, reserved very much an elite. Um, a privileged um, form of education in English. The alternative is public, the public sector, where the, which I described as having a local um, medium of instruction. It's free and it's non-elite. 
However, recently there's been a change and um, there is now um, a, a new sector has crept in. Um, and this is partly in association with um, the um, Millennium Goals, Millennium Development Goals, the, finally the right of children to free and compulsory education act was introduced in India in 2009 so very recently that's been a turning point in India's educational <coughs> history because it's obliged all states to provide free quality basic schooling to all children to the age of 14 and most of these are first generation learners However, there's been a, a, a great deal of neglect in India's state school system, very poor infrastructure, dilapidated buildings, absent teachers, um, low student attainment and progression. Many states were not prepared to respond to the um, Right to Education Act in 2009 and having to catch up very quickly and provide the level of, of, of infrastructure and teacher training um, that is required. Um, however, parents are also have become aware of the importance of education for their children, even parents who have not had education themselves. And rather than wait for the public sector to catch up, they have um, opted for a new sector, which is the low-cost sector, the low-cost private school sector, a very new sector. Um, and this is the third, uh, third um, division. Um, these are often English medium schools. They, they charge very little, um, but um, they are attracting a great number of children from the, um, the state school sector. They're often um, attracting more boys than girls. Um, very poor parents are going into debt to provide um, to send their children there um, and they are actually the, the parents of those children those children are still disadvantaged because they do not speak English they have very little access to English so these schools operate in a kind of non-English vacuum those schools also are set up by business people um, who have no educational background and the teachers are untrained And the focus of the study, um, as, as John said, is um, in, uh, I didn't realize that arrow would <coughs> keep flashing. Um, it is in the state of Bihar, which is um, borders Nepal. It's the second poorest state in, um, in India. And um, it is, um, has 109 million inhabitants. Um, it has, um, of very high levels of poverty, very high levels of, of, of children, 46% of the state are um, under 18 years old. It has two languages, um, uh, well, Hindi is its main language, but it has a large number of related Bihari languages, and it's considered that most 53% of children speak um, these um, dialects of, of, of Hindi. It has the highest number of um, out-of-school children, highest number of uh, student-teacher ratios, very low resource schools. I should mention that, um, that Bihar is one of the 35 states or union territories in India. It is, it is, there is much variation across India, so it's partially representative but not fully representative of the country. Like, as in, in, um, in Ghana, we visited a number of schools, a number of these low-cost English medium schools. This is different from Ghana, in that Ghana there was a national policy, and the study was looking at um, the implementation of that policy um, on the ground and views around that policy. Here we're looking at a kind of um, a third sector, the low-cost English medium school sector, is unregulated and it therefore meant um, that the visits had to be very sensitive because there was a sense that we were inspecting those schools. We compared um, th this low-cost English medium private sector with um, 
government sector school, and government sector school was teaching English as a subject, and um, so obviously we weren't comparing like with like, we are comparing an English medium school with an English as a sub air school with English as a subject. However, there are, there are marked differences and there are quite a lot of similarities as well. The main differences you can see um, is that the private, low cost English medium private schools um, were often extremely um, crowded, um, um, partly because they were businesses and the public or government schools were very often um, very spacious and, and a better teacher ratio, um, partly because of the abandonment of those schools temporarily to this new sector. The level of discipline in the low-cost English medium private schools was phenomenally high and a great deal of punishment, not really about using, um, in, um, using the mother tongue, but about um, all kinds of practices like not bringing the right book at school, not bringing the, having the right books. Um, whereas the, the public schools, they had what they called a loving attitude. The teachers were loving. It was a new, relatively new approach. And um, with very vulnerable children, this was extremely positive and important. Um, again, um, a great contrast between the very strict testing regime in the low-cost English medium schools and the less um, strenuous regime in terms of testing in the public school sector. The private schools had no playgrounds and, and didn't have any opportunities for breaks, whereas the public school, um, there was a great deal of play and, um, and freedom. Um, however, they were similar in other ways in the, the types of, they're very course book um, focused and a very limited form of activities and, and um, very teacher um, centered um, and um, so similar to Ghana in, in many ways um, and um, I and in terms of the language used um, in the English medium schools what was interesting was that although there was no clear policy around language use we asked them what is your language policy? They didn't really have one. But what was interesting is that the teachers all um, co-switched between um, Hindi and English constantly, mainly paraphrasing and translating. Um, and this was clearly an intuitive practice. They weren't um, they weren't trained teachers, and they but they clearly they basically translated everything in the course book. Um, this might um, uh, and this was presumably was facilitative to the students. That also happened in the English language lessons in the public school. Um, the teacher translated everything from one language to another, from Hindi to English, or English to Hindi. Very little of the local language was used. And although that practice of dual language or switching may be seen as beneficial, the main problem was that the students didn't speak at all. Um, it was up to 95% teacher talking time, and children listened and copied, listened and copied. And the main, um, they copied words from the board, mainly words in translation. There's a very strong focus on what words mean, but very little <coughs> focus on how words are current, connected with each other or, or how they might um, um, how they might be pronounced or how they might work in a sentence. or. Um, so um, there was also a very strong um, correlation with the learning of memorization of facts. Um, and it was very difficult for us to n have any idea in either context what students were learning, what they understood, what made sense to them, and in terms of subject and in terms of um, langu the, the languages. So here's just an example of read and underline the hard words. Um, um, and, and, and these word lists that were very, um, very common translation of words and being tested. Um, so a final or slide um, looks ahead. So this is, um, there are signs that um, uh, the pub public sector is responding very well to um, a massive investment program and um, it's training 
a large number of teachers, it's reforming the curriculum, it's building new schools, it's, it's starting to provide quality education to a whole new generation of children in India. And this is a very significant step in India's history in the public sector, the government school sector. Um, these schools have also recently elected to introduce English as a subject at a higher level instead of level P1, it's going back to P3, primary three in Bihar. So again, realizing that it isn't necessarily helpful to start so low with English um, so early. And um, also, um, Also, the fact that um, Bihar and other states in India, um, and so there is, sorry, and there is a gradual shift away from the low-cost private sector back into the government sector, and this must be seen as positive. There is a recognition that the government schools have something to offer. Perhaps the low-cost English medium schools were a temporary stopgap. Um, so. A vastly improved state school system is a very important step in educating huge numbers of hitherto excluded learners in India. However, it must be concluded that for as long as India has a three-sector system involving either English medium education or Hindi or dual medium, the prospects of meeting um, the Sustainable Development Goals 4, 8 and 16 remain unlikely. And I'd like to just conclude with a final slide. Is it on my no. I've got it. Um, with Beth, which embraces both contexts. Uh, do, you, do you want to do it? You can get it. Oh, well. <laughs> I don't mind making both of um, They are very different contexts. But at the end, um, of, um, t the most important issue is around improving um, classroom practice and making it more participatory, whatever language it is in, that is really lacking both in Ghana and in India. And the only way one can improve um, participatory practices and more um, learner-centered pedagogy is through teacher education. And at, at the end of our publication, and here we just summarize some of our ideas for how to improve <coughs> teacher education, and we've both worked on on international teacher education projects that have have really used technology and video in 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 very um, innovative ways um, with in teacher education systems, and for um, in, in in Ghana in particular, where there is a policy around using the mother tongue. One of the biggest problems is that people don't know how to enact it, and there are no good examples of ha what it actually means in action. So I think we we need some, yeah, same. <laughs> that we need videos, guides, adaptable lesson outlines for teacher education, teacher ed educators. They need to know how to use the Ghanaian languages. Uh, the local languages and English to support the curriculum um, and, and curriculum learning and also to support spoken English language, uh, particularly spoken language if that is the medium of instruction. Um, it's hard for students to learn if, if they're not involved in any spoken learning activities and if they can't speak then um, then we're getting nowhere. Um, so, and people of th this conference have been talking about ways of rec recruiting teachers who do speak local languages and the languages of students. Um, and um, yes, and we we have some ideas collected also in the book about pr promoting spoken language skills and dialogue. Um, <laughs> and using language creatively, playfully, meaningfully in, in different activities, using visuals um, to make teaching more accessible, um, and ways in which other people elsewhere ha have also talked about how to better align the English language curriculum with other subject curricula. Um, so yes, again, they're in the report. So. Um, yeah, we will. Do you have anything else you want to add? Okay, we will uh, finish there and take some questions before lunch, hopefully.
Thanks very much to both of you. Uh, any questions or comments from the floor? Uh, yeah, just um, echoing something that the, one of the other questions asked about. It's hard to learn if you're not involved in any speaking activities and the need to be participatory and the recommendations for role play, etc., etc. Um, yeah, just wondering how this links in with the actual curriculum which teachers have to follow in the end of term test, which probably, I'm guessing, doesn't involve any speaking or assessment of your ability to participate. Mm -hmm. So linking that in with the, with the curriculum teachers have to follow and, and tests and all that, all that stuff. Yeah? Okay, so that's set. I'll hand it over to you. Somebody has to turn off their mic. Um, okay, so um, just quickly about the, I think probably Lena has some responses too about gender, but um, we didn't look much at gender in, in, in our Ghanaian research, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, the first thing I would say there is that the type of low-cost English medium schools that are emerging in India, I believe, are also emerging in Ghana as well. And we did not investigate them, and I think that would be a great site for investigation in future, of future research and looking at also whether there's these um, gender differences. Um, whether gender affects talking or not, it's hard to say when nobody's talking anyway. Um, no one is talking. So um, uh, probably, it, um, um, but I, I, it, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. The role of language in, in bridging the gender divide, I think the ideas, some of the ideas from the first publication about English language teen, or language learning and language learning classrooms as, as providing opportunities to bridge divides might provide some. While there's not some, there they weren't particularly focused on gender. I think some of the ideas there could be um, inspiring for that. And finally, thank you for your very um, perceptive um, question. And I, I. Sh I noted that I failed to mention in talking about these English language teaching projects in this book, all of them know the value of multilingualism and also of, of, of using other languages in the English language classroom and, um, um, and, uh, and, and the different roles of different languages for local and global communication. So I, I hope that the two publications are not um, giving um, different messages around multilingualism, but um, that given that English is a language so commonly taught in so many curricula around the world, if we cannot do a better job of making the way it's taught um, help um, people to deal with locally divisive issues and in doing so also draw, draw on locally relevant content and, and, and local languages in, in doing that. Um, and, Paul, and if you have anything to add to any of those, please, or you, yeah, please do. I just had a couple of additions uh, regarding um, the gender of, among students. Um, I think as long as schools are fee paying, whether they're elite fee paying or um, low cost fee paying um, in, in some parts of the world um, um, where people um, have to make choices around um, spending, sadly um, boys will be privileged and, and that um, there, there were many more girls in the, in the public government schools than, the, than in the low-cost English medium. Um, and, and parents were prioritizing boys over girls. Um, with um, with uh, regards to gender and speaking, I think you were focusing on teachers. Um, I think your question was about teachers. And in the primary schools, generally, um, there were more, um, in the government schools, there were more women teachers by far, very few male teachers. Um, but um, I can't say that we noticed a great difference between whether male teachers, there were more male teachers in the low-cost English medium schools 
generally they all spoke a lot. And um, with the students, well, they, the students, as Beth said, spoke so little you couldn't really tell any difference. And the other point I just wanted to follow up was, I think it was your point about participatory practice within um, teacher education. And, and um, in India, um, the teachers we found in, uh, in many different projects, well, in a major project where I'm working on at the moment called TESS India, that the teachers and, and other people in the British Council will be aware of this, that teachers will be able to cite, will, will, will be able to talk about um, their participatory practices very, very um, convincingly. They know exactly what, you know, they, 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 they can talk about all kinds of different kinds of classroom practices and possibly think they're doing it. Um, but actually in the classroom they don't. And um, we have recently, um, as part of Test India, um, this project that I've been involved in, this mass scale teacher development project in India, um, we we interviewed teachers to ask them how they were accessing these open educational teacher development resources. And most of them spoke about the videos being the most important tool for understanding how to apply participatory practices. They knew about it in theory, but when they saw the videos of teachers doing it in India, that suddenly um, made sense to them. So that may be what is required in teacher development, much more um, the show and showing than talking. Um, and that's something you mentioned. Yeah, and just very briefly, sorry, I know that people's lunch clocks have probably gone off. Um, picking up on the, on the last point about the possible contradictory sounding nature of, uh, of, of the um, the way that English is perceived and often a, 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 in reality as a, a, as a language of, um, of opportunity. Um, we could have, I think it would have been perfectly possible to have um, produced a book with very similar outcomes that could have been around a completely different language or better still around multilingual practices. And in fact, a lot of the chapters do um, uh, acknowledge the multilingual chap um, practices that can be used in the classroom. Um, but the notion of using um, English, which is so widely taught, um, as a platform, as an opportunity for uh, peace and intercultural understanding, um, I think is, is, you know, that, that we could see um, what a strong um, opportunity this, this gives many teachers. And even better still, incidentally, if multilingual practices are already in place. Thank you very much. Well, against all the odds, our panel have brought us back onto time, so can you join me in thanking them, not only for the quality, but also for the quantity of their interventions. Thank you very much. Thank you.